Hey, everybody. Welcome to The Daily Objective. And we've got a, quite a treat for you today. We're going to be talking about religion and the departure from religion. Happy Yom Kippur to everybody. It's the Holy Day of Atonement. Uh, we, I want to say on behalf of ARC UK, if there's anyone we clashed with, if there's any bad blood, today is the day we would like you to apologize. Please uh, <laughs> comment, super chat, best of all, and consider becoming an Ayn Rand Center UK member to get exclusive content as well as help this thing sustain and grow. Um, all right, let's talk about this, guys. We got a, a, uh, a full house star studded evening. Listen, first off, we've got a guy from Greece itself. He could play Aristotle in a movie, and someday I hope he will. Please welcome Nikos Sotirakopoulos. Thank you. And we've got a guy who uh, he could play somebody in a movie, and I think he has, and I think he will. Please welcome a guy who not only turned his back on God, but became literally the devil. It's Mark Lucifer Pellegrino. What's up, Rucka? I like your haircut. Thank it's actually not a haircut. Uh, it's just me not doing anything yeah, to it. Thank okay, you. I like it. I, I, like I appreciate it. the compliment. I really shouldn't argue with it. Uh, and please, let's welcome a <coughs> first-time guest. This is uh, a philosopher at the Ayn Rand Institute. And uh, he, you might see him hosting the New Ideal podcast. You might even catch him on Clubhouse. Please welcome a guy who also turned his back on Jesus Christ and has some explaining to do today. It's Ben Bayer. Thanks, Rucker. Glad to be here. So uh, I guess uh, we'll, we'll learn about you, Ben, and uh, all of us hosts can sort of chime in with various questions or comments, comparisons. Mark uh, has a religious background, as do I. Nikos has a like communist background, which sometimes can behave like a religion. Um, okay, what religion were you brought up with, Ben? Well, I was raised Catholic. I, I was uh, part of a very Catholic family. The anecdote that is the most telling here is that my own mother was actually a Catholic nun uh, for uh, 14 years before she uh, left the convent and uh, met my dad. Uh, Sound of Music is one of my favorite movies uh, for this reason. Um, so, and then even, even after she had left uh, the convent, she still was a, a church worker. So she was the, basically the principal of the Sunday school at our church, whichever church we were at, that was her full-time profession. Um, and so, yeah, there was some influence there on me because of that. And, um, yeah, I could, obviously I'll, we'll talk more about how I, uh, uh, turned my back on it soon, but that, that's the basic background. That's pretty amazing about your mother being a nun at one point. I, we could do a full episode about what that was like and the effects that that had. Um, so you're Catholic, um, now was there a sort of political leaning at your church? Was there any sort of like, was it generally kind of surprisingly maybe like leftist economically, or was it more like what we would recognize as like evangelical type of Christians today? So I don't, I, it may be that I just didn't have as much political sensitivity uh, at the time that I was attending the church that, uh, and as a result, I didn't notice that there was a particular political leaning. I do know that it was at least on theological questions, it was a more liberal Catholic church. And my parents were definitely liberal Democrats. And so there's, there's actually, there's two stories to be told here because uh, I went from being a liberal democratic Catholic uh, to being an objectivist atheist, uh, roughly in the course of two years. So it was a, it was a 180 degree conversion. And so I don't like that word conversion when you're talking about becoming rational. Right. Uh, was abortion a big deal uh, back then? It probably was to some extent. I, I think I remember there being uh, anti-abortion propaganda distributed, uh, at least, you know, in the, uh, the back wing of the church. Probably it was the subject of some sermons. Uh, this is something that even the most liberal of Catholic institutions don't uh, really avoid. They can't really avoid it. Uh, all of their authorities still uh, agree on that one. Um, so that, and that's something else that I also changed my mind about. 
Uh, I want to dig deep, but let me ask you, Mark, what religion uh, were you growing up? What type of Christianity? I didn't have religion in my house, but I was a sort of a latchkey kid and was farmed out to various people to watch me growing up. And those people were religious. Um, in fact, I still have my first little Bible from my quote unquote babysitters who would take me to Sunday school. Um, and so it was a non-denominational uh, version of Christianity. I don't remember what it was, but it planted a seed in me for sure. And later on, when uh, when L.A. was going through its uh, social experiment of busing kids uh, around uh, in public schools and taking them out of their districts and putting them in the inner city and vice versa, uh, my mom decided to send me to a private school. And the most affordable one was a Catholic uh, high school. So I went to Catholic high school and got really introduced to religion there at the perfect time of my life because I was 14, 15. I think that's when you're really searching for answers and. And here comes religion class uh, every single day, uh, reading the Bible every single day and going to mass, actual masses in the gym and pretending like I was a Catholic. I never got confirmed, but I, I, I you know, I took the Eucharist. I, 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 I did. I, I went through the motions of of being a legit Catholic. And I believed in it one time wanted to be a, a brother. Uh, the, 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 the organization that ran our school was the were the Brothers of the Holy Cross and I found them educated and interesting, compelling folks, and I wanted to be like them. Interesting. So, um, yeah, non-denominational churches are like a, a very uh, interesting phenomenon, I guess, in, in, the, in modern times. Um, now, Ben, uh, were you indoctrinated heavily at school? Did you go to a public school, a private school? Well, this, this is part and parcel of uh, our, our churches being uh, somewhat liberal. I, there wasn't as much pressure to send kids to uh, an actual Catholic school. And I didn't go to a Catholic school. I went to public school, but I still went to CCD or uh, re religion class every week. And so I was, I, you could say I was indoctrinated there. Of course, I was also indoctrinated at home since my mom was the one running the program. And though I'll, I'm, if my mom's watching, I, I wouldn't use that word necessarily to <laughs> describe what she did at home. And I have uh, respect for her. I'll say more about that later. So Ben, when you think back to these years, so Ben, the religious person, so what's the first image that comes to your mind in terms of feeling? So was it a reassuring? Was it optimist that wherever I go, someone is with me? So compared to how you walk, how you carry yourself nowadays in life, how would you compare it to your religious days? Well, I went through a, a development. Um, I think that when I was younger, my earliest memories are probably of just being confused by what was going on and having a certain kind of wonder, you know, imagining God up on a cloud. Uh, I think as I got older, I oscillated between being annoyed by it and then taking it very seriously. And the probably the most interesting story here to tell is that um, I started to take it the most seriously uh, my my uh, my first year in high school, which was my sophomore year, and it was a combination of factors I think that that led me to do that. Part of it was just this is what I had been raised with, and I thought, well, if 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 religion is supposed to be this source of our morality and the meaning of life, I, sh I, I probably should take it seriously. Uh, and to, I think I got to the point of even taking it more seriously than um, some of my elders wanted me to, uh, because it, it was funny because this was around the time of, uh, this was around 1990 and the Gulf War was happening. And, you know, uh, apocalyptic battle in the Middle East uh, was, Lots of grist for the mill of many a late night evangelical TV preacher who wanted to say that this was the the this was going to be Armageddon and the uh, there was going to be a second coming of Christ. There was one guy in particular I started watching, not Catholic evangelical, who uh, who was saying all this stuff. And I names, and I, names please. Names, oh, Jack Vanampy, if you if you must know, I, I think know. he's still going, which is fascinating. Um, but. 
uh, you know, he had this whole narrative about all, you know, which which of the different parties involved in the war were Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, which was the kingdom of the east and the kingdom of the north, and uh, where they were going to meet uh, and Megiddo and so forth. And I kind of bought into it for a while, and I thought it's all the right there in the Book of Revelation and Book of Daniel, and I didn't understand why my my uh, my Catholic uh, elders weren't taking it more seriously. And of course, they said, "Well, that's all metaphorical; uh, you can't take it literally." Uh, but I pushed it to the point where I, I I actually thought it was happening, going to be happening for maybe a month or two. And then I started to notice inconsistencies, <laughs> in, big inconsistencies in the stories that the, the TV preachers were telling, uh, the number of uh, states in the uh, Roman Empire, the 10 horned beast or whatever was supposed to be the EU. And uh, then the EU added three countries and they didn't mention that part. Uh, in their so stories. where are we in the timeline, there. though? Where are we in the timeline? So you said at some point it took two years to quote convert. So where are we now? This is high school Iraq war. This is where I'm pushing religion to its limits to see where it goes in my mind. And since I pushed it that far and it started to break, uh, it was around after that point, especially with a few other uh, issues that I'll mention, where it started to break down. Um, so like I was told that God, you know, God doesn't like TV, doesn't like, you know, uh, secular entertainment. So right off the bat, as a kid, I had this conflict between God and what I enjoyed. Uh, did you ever have any conflict between what, you know, Catholicism instructed versus what you were drawn to growing up? Yeah. And, and this was, this was the other big issue. So, um, I think the biggest the biggest conflict was about sex, uh, and I was a adolescent teenage boy. I liked women. Um, my religion kept telling me that it was a sin to fornicate. Uh, at the time, I wasn't lucky enough to really have any opportunities to do it, but I, sh I sure did want to, uh, and uh, that caused a lot of frustration. Details of which I won't go into entirely but I'll, i will <laughs> i will mention one example which i think was telling which is uh it, it, i had a very close friend um who uh was you know, my best friend and i was somebody who didn't really have best friends up until later in my teenage years and so it was a really rare and wonderful thing that i was able to get a best friend and he had a girlfriend and uh they started having sex <laughs> And because I was uh, at the time a pretty serious Catholic and opposed morally to fornication, um, I started morally judging my own best friend for this. And it almost ruined the friendship, uh, which would have been a terrible thing. But this is another. I, do, do you think that judgment came in part from your own frustration? displaced probably yeah probably so and i think that's an insightful question because i think it often does for people um i think i think that's part of all all irrational philosophies uh, are rationalizations for something else and i think that's often what it is what the what the religious uh proscription on on sex often not always but often comes from um so it, yeah there is a connection there but i pushed this is another case where i was pushing the the limits of the belief to kind of to see where it would go and what i what i discovered was that this is going to end my like one and only meaningful friendship and so maybe there's something wrong with it and so that was another that was another case where the where where it failed the test you should Had have philosophy entered the frame on that point when when <laughs> did philosophy enter the frame or did it no at that point were you interested in philosophy in general or was the interest in philosophy part of this starting question because my question would be why is someone who takes religion so seriously why would you need philosophy i i was not yet interested in philosophy at that point that's i think the answer to the question it was only it was another year or so until i started to get interested in philosophy and in in large part to fill a vacuum mm. the, where religion the, had been on the topic of sex i mean you should have joined a non-denominational church they might have just given you some condoms and told you to <laughs> to have fun but 
But that, I mean, these sort of modern churches, in a way, they become like less religious, but but kind of also more difficult to strip away oh. and identify because they're so sort of liberal. Um, I, I don't I don't I have to push back on that a little bit because mm-hmm. I was a nominal Catholic for a while. And then I got into the born again movement, this sort of Pentecostal Baptist movement through the roughly the same periods as Ben seemed to be, uh, you know, in the early 90s, right around the time of the supposed apocalypse. And I found a lot of these, there there was a movement in Hollywood where a bunch of actors were turning to God and looking to religion for answers. But, you know, the typical conservative churches weren't their vibe. So there were places like, there were preachers like Tim Story, who was sort of the Hollywood preacher. There was uh, the Hideaway, which was a sort of rock and roll church that I would go to bunch of places where you could find really cool people who are also having tons of sex. So it wasn't like they they uh, they took that part of Christianity very seriously. They might feel guilty afterwards, but they they weren't allowing it to stop them from doing what they wanted to do. Um, and 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 uh, and that's the, the space I live. There were some conservative churches like uh, the Jesus Christ Faith Center on Adams in Vermont, where I was actually baptized it's African-American a church right down the street from First AME. Um, right after the riots. And it was one of the most uh, amazing experiences that I had, but truly not of the type of Pentecostal experience where you get carried away with the, with the spirit of Jesus and end up having sex with your neighbor. The, uh, the approach of uh, like Christianity to sex, I mean, can be very extreme and Catholics, especially, I mean, it sounds like maybe Ben, you're, your version of Catholicism was not nearly as, um, uh, you know, conservative as some of them can be when, with regards to sex, but, but still, I imagine it's psychologically upsetting. Uh, so I was, especially I, when you have to go to confession and, and, and tell the priest about all the things you did. Wow. So I was, um, not generally... knowing that some of them might be taking very careful notes. <laughs> Wow. I was I was uh, so I, I grew up in a very strict Orthodox Jewish community and I was jealous of Christians having so few commandments. So like so few obligations. Uh, but n- knowing what I know now about kind of what it takes to reverse engineer away from religion and to kind of free yourself um, psychologically, I I'm glad I was not raised any type of Christian, let alone Catholic. So um, I'm sorry you went through that. And uh, good to have you here. Let's uh, let's find out how you got here. Um, can you describe uh, the, the, the the departure from religion? Were you drawn to something else, or was it just that you were kind of uh, fed up with religion? Well, this is I think this is a, an especially interesting story, and uh, especially in connection with what we were just discussing, because in a way, it was actually sex that got me out of religion, <laughs> um, not in a direct way, but. Um, so I, I had a uh, serious high school crush on uh, a girl who happened to be Muslim, like the only Muslim in our school, I think, maybe one of two. Uh, and because of that, I mean, the thing I was inclined to do back then when I had a crush was to obsess over everything I could find out about the person. And so I said, well, I should get myself a copy of the Quran and read it to see where she's coming from. And uh, the, the crush never ended up going anywhere. And I, you know, ended up having three different crushes that year on different people. Uh, but the, I, what I took away from reading the Quran definitely had an impact on me. And what it was, was that here's this whole alternate <laughs> religious system with its whole own text, uh, which is believed by, you know, millions of people around the world, including this a couple of people I know at this time. Uh, they're even, you know, going to war with us in the Middle East. And so, you know, they're kind of a big deal. And it's a, just a completely different system from mine. And I was especially taken by the fact it wasn't completely different. There were, there were points of contact, like the, the Quran says that Jesus Christ was a real person, but he was just a prophet and he wasn't the son of God. And so it's like, well, so they acknowledge some of the same facts that my side does, but they have a different take on it. And so what this amounted to was it was a kind of argument for agnosticism from uh, religious uh, diversity. The fact that there's all these different people, they all have different views. They can't all be right. 
why is my view the one right view? And especially when you think about, well, the only reason I have my view is because it's what my parents raised me to believe. And I, all these other people were raised by their parents to believe different things. I haven't actually, I didn't, it's not like I went shopping for the most logical or rational religion in the first place. I, it was just something that was given to me, like these other people uh, were given theirs. And that to me was a very powerful uh, source of doubt. And so um, I think within uh, the space of a year, like right after my sophomore year, which I just told you about my junior year is when I started to doubt everything. Uh, it's right after I'd read the book, right after I read the, a lot of the Quran. And I, it was when I was supposed to be getting confirmed. And my, my, my own mother was the one running the confirmation program. And I went to the, I went to all the classes and I think I, I, you know, passed all the tests, but when it came time for the, the ultimate uh, ceremony, I declined and the, the good thing is that my, my mom let me, uh, even though she was both my mother and the head of the program, her own son, uh, she wasn't able to win over. And uh, I knew other people, for instance, who were even more doubtful. Like I knew kids who were already atheists uh, and their parents made them get confirmed. My mother did not make me get from, confirmed. I have a lot of, I give her a lot of credit for that. That's Can I ask amazing. you something? So when you would discuss these questions with your mother, so what you just told us, which by the way, sounds advanced for that age so that's quite mature thinking i'd like what to think there... i could have done better earlier but but thank you <laughs> well no I, I i mean it so what would be her answer so you would say look you and the muslims can both be wrong so why is it that you are wrong and they're not wrong so someone who has devoted her life to christianity what would be the still manning answer that she would give to that question I don't remember if I've ever had this specific conversation with her, but I imagine what she and a lot of other people like her would say is something like, well, there, there's a point to ecumenicalism that, that there's a sense in which, yeah, all these different faiths do have uh, some kind of grasp of the truth, but we all see the truth in our own ways. Uh, and this is the one that we've been, the tradition we've been raised in on the basis of our lived experience. Uh, that was her kind of, that would have been, I think, her kind of liberal relativistic answer at the time. Uh, you, you might get different answers from different people, but there was never an effort to try to convince me why this was the right one. I, I admire the fact that you were able to get out of it so quickly, because I had a, I had a, a, a revelatory moment similar to yours, but very intense. I was at the Four Square Church in Van Nuys and Sherman Way, huge church. Pastor Jack Hayford was helming it. He was a very articulate guy, almost scientific in his sermons. And I, was, I had been reading Rand already at the time. So there was, there was a wedge that was coming between me and my church experience. And then a song came up and everybody was singing this song with joy, with glee. And the song was entitled, Bathe Me in the Blood of Jesus. And I, I took it literally as if they were taking it literally. And I stood up and walked out of the church and I never went back. I never went back to a church again, but I could not shake the idea of God. And I think it comes from my own up upbringing and my, not religious upbringing, but psych psychological trauma in my upbringing that wouldn't let me let go of this idea for a very, very long time, even though I understood it to be illogical. A lot of uh, heroic action here today. Uh, I don't take these stories lightly at all. I bet they were very, um, I bet they were very challenging at the time. Um, so Ben, did you, so did you become an, a, like an atheist explicitly at this point? Not yet. I think I was basically an agnostic for maybe two years. Uh, and in part, it's because I, I, I mean, so the doubt that I had was this just based on my own experience. I, I was not really influenced by any kind of intellectual arguments that I've been hearing. It was about it was about a year into that experience where I started reading philosophy. Uh, and I was I was originally interested in philosophy because I was in high school debate. And uh, there was a particular category called Lincoln Douglas debate where you got into debates about moral and political philosophy. And so I started reading some of the major texts from major figures, Kant, Locke, Rawls, Rousseau, uh, other, Mill. And 
And what what struck me the most was at the time was, wow, there's the all these philosophers who've tried to find some kind of rational source of morality. Now, I don't think most of those actually had a rational source, but at the time, you know, the way I was thinking of it was here they are trying to give arguments uh, for what they think is a standard of morality. And I some as being someone who was sort of lost because I was in now a new intellectual vacuum, I was like, I could really use a moral compass from something outside of religion. And so that's when I discovered philosophy. Uh, and so how my, old are you at that point? That's my junior year, uh, late junior year, early senior year in high school. And for uh, us Europeans who don't know what this translates to? Uh, 16, 17. Mm. All right. So the transition starts, let's say, fifth minute kind of escalate 16 and 17. Yeah, that's that's too young. I mean, the, that's uh, I'm surprised you said you should have figured this out uh, earlier. Well, I know because... people who, who figured it out a lot earlier than that. <laughs> wow. Yeah, and some of them are yeah. also just not raised with it to begin with. And that, that was a head start. And uh, who knows where some of these people end up? Like some people, they, they learn things too fast. But, you know, turns out anyway, I mean, there's so many different types of people. Some people never get it. Um, but anyway, uh, you um, you are interested in kind of different approaches to ethics and philosophy. Um, at what point did you uh, <coughs> find uh, Ayn Rand's work? Or is that later in the story? Is there more It's to tell about before then? Around that same time as I'm surveying different philosophies. And I'm sure there were debate rounds. I was in various tournaments where Ayn Rand's name came up. Uh, and it certainly her name would have come up, I think, with my debate coach, who was a libertarian. Uh, and the first thing I read was philosophy who needs it. And it's because I was at a Barnes and Noble. Barnes and Noble, by the way, was instrumental, intellectually speaking, lots of ways. You're living in a relatively middle sized town in the Midwest. And we, there, prior to Barnes and Noble, there were no uh, there was only one tiny bookstore with almost nothing in it on philosophy, but Barnes and Noble comes in and there's a whole huge shelf of books on philosophy, including a whole shelf on uh, of Ayn Rand books. And so I uh, had been, you know, browsing through that first to get my other philosophy titles. And then I found this philosophy who needs it. And I flipped through it. And there's all these different essays on all these different philosophers, Kant and Rawls and, and Feyerabend. And, and so I thought I should read this, if only because it's got some critiques of these other philosophers. I get their arguments in debate rounds. I want to be able to answer them. I think I had heard somebody reference this book. I read it. And the thing that stuck with me the most was the title essay, uh, because it was a really compelling argument for why philosophy mattered. And not even because I knew much of anything about her philosophy. I didn't. You don't, if you don't, read carefully you, you won't know you won't figure out a lot about objectivism per se from reading a lot of the other essays in philosophy who needs it so that was what got me interested in rand not yet agreeing with her i didn't really know that much about what she thought uh but then i think because my debate coach recommended uh the fountainhead and because i knew there was a essay contest that i could write an essay for i started reading that i thought at the time you know being the uh still being a kind of lefty liberal type I, that I disagreed with, would disagree with Rand. Uh, I actually thought of myself more as a Rawlsian, believe it or not. And so I, I read The Fountainhead thinking I'll write a critical essay for the essay contest. I, I don't know why they, I thought they would give me money for that, but I never actually got around to writing anything. I was just too busy by the time the deadline arrived, but it didn't matter because by, the by that time I was halfway through and I was already hooked. Uh, and so it was definitely The Fountainhead that pushed me over to just completely reorienting my views and uh, giving me the sense that there's that there here's an here's an example of a of a rational morality that I could follow and I very quickly found the virtue of selfishness and read the objectivist ethics and found it fascinating and and difficult to argue against and didn't have the flaws that I'd seen in the other uh, nominally secular moralities and uh, Then it was a very short time, I think, by the time I'm a freshman in college, uh, where I decided to become an atheist, and as opposed to merely an agnostic. And, and last thing I'll say about that is that this is like, the, I think when you first encounter a new philosophy, as I did, there's a, uh, it's, it's, it's expected and normal that you would go through a period of struggle 
in uh, thinking about what it says, trying to evaluate its arguments, um, considering counter arguments. I did all of that when I was a freshman in college. I went to the library. I tried to find books that were critical about objectivism. I read every one I could find. Um, I couldn't quite uh, answer all the arguments that I was encountering, but uh, I knew that there was something off about them. And it was really then that I found Dr. Peikoff's book, Objectivism and the Philosophy of Ayn Rand, which should be just uh, celebrated the 30th anniversary of at our recent Ocon. And that book was uh, really important because it, it gave me this systematic understanding of the philosophy, or, or at least a picture of what a systematic understanding would look like. I don't know if I had the understanding yet. And it helped me see a lot of the flaws in the critical arguments that I'd been reading. And even though on a number of issues, there was still a lot of struggle, still a lot of uh, uh, development in my understanding that was needed. The one issue where I experienced something as close to a momentary changing of my mind as anything has ever been was when I read the section toward the beginning of Opar on metaphysics were in the section where he talks about God uh, and explains how, if you accept these axioms, the, um, the concept of God is just contradictory. It was, in the, it was in the space of reading that section that I went from becoming an agnostic to an atheist. Uh, and I mean, I remember the moment. And um, I, it was because it, was, it, was, it made it very clear. So you As didn't the, have contact with... Uh atheists like uh, Hitchens and Dawkins. So it was through philosophy, not through atheists. That's basically correct. I mean, I, I think I, I knew some friends in high school who were free thinker, skeptic types. Maybe one of them was an atheist who would occasionally uh, raise challenging questions with me that I couldn't answer. Um, but I don't think that was so much of an influence as the just understanding that there were so many people who had different beliefs and then the subsequent encounter with philosophy. Well, there weren't so many professional atheists back then that you could, you could follow podcasts for. The internet was really in its early days. Um, I didn't know that much about how to use it. So it was mostly just, uh, you know, my grappling with philosophic issues. I do remember there was a, when I was in college, um, there was a debating society that I joined and one time there was a, they had a different resolution every week. And uh, one, one week it was resolved that God exists. And that was my, that was the, I think the fall semester of my freshman year. And I went into that debate thinking, all right, now is, now is their last chance. I'm going to listen to what these people have to say. At the time I was just reading Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology, not really understanding it very well. But I knew that there was this rational epistemology out there and I listened to the arguments that they gave, uh, the, the side that was in favor of God's existence. One of them was a rather prominent Jesuit priest uh, who taught philosophy class at the university. And uh, his, I, I, the arguments just did not persuade me. And uh, it was just a few months until then I would read Opar and, and that would solidify it for me. Has, has there been kind of a, a, a journey in like kind of identifying premises, like maybe, you know, being shamed with regard to sex early in life and then later finding yourself maybe having a, a certain attitude towards that or in other ways uh, carrying an altruist premise with regards to ethics or mystic type of premise that you need to identify and correct? God, yes. Um, <laughs> so I, I mentioned having had this sort of, uh, change of momentary change of perspective when I went from being an atheist, from being an agnostic to an atheist. But that was the only thing that was like that. Everything else was much more complicated. I mean, it was still, uh, uh, just to give one example, it was another year, I think, um, before I stopped being depressed about the fact that I was not going to have immortality. Uh, I, 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 it's, it's strange because now it like this does not even occur to me. And even within once that year had elapsed, I was sort of perplexed about why I took that so seriously. But there was a period there where I was like, wait, so I'm just going to die. And that's it. And now I'm like, yeah, OK, that's that's mm -hmm. the way things are. Um, but there, there was some psychological struggle with that. Uh, and definitely. Uh, struggle on some of the other issues you mentioned where I retained 
various religious premises, uh, moral and psychological, which in spite of consciously recognizing to be wrong, were still deeply ingrained in me. Uh, I can't tell you how many times um, in the first few years, uh, various beggars on the streets uh, convinced me to give them a handout and because uh, I felt guilty about not doing it. And uh, eventually it, it was discovery that so many of them were just telling complete falsehoods that <laughs> that, that, that was helpful. But um, wow. yeah, so there were definitely struggles still after that. And to, the, to this day, to this day on, on various issues. Yeah, the struggle goes on. Um, well, I, I mean, that's, that's a great story. I, I love the reoccurring um, mention of women and sex in this intellectual journey. I mean, that's that's the real deal. A lot, Not a lot of intellectuals describe that aspect of life as contributing, but I think that's the way it is. Um, yeah. You know, and it's not about if I'm going to get this girl. It's about the fact that, you know, women exist and I'm choosing the possibility of this over God and the afterlife. And yeah. uh, it's, it's, a, it's a real choice people uh, might need to make. All right. Uh, I guess we can jump over to Super Chats, uh, unless Nikos or Mark, you have uh, some. I have long. one question, but I'll ask it at the end as a grand finale. OK, uh, so Mary Lean with the Super Chat. Thank you. Thank you again, Mary Lean. Robert says it's the strangest thing. Friends I know who were raised with religion and believed it, but didn't take it that seriously. How they weren't frightened by an eternity in hell was inexplicable. Yeah, it's interesting. So many people who kind of stick with religion, they never really took it all that seriously. Whereas some people who kind of took religion very seriously in the first place end up rejecting it because they're so kind of serious. Yeah, so one thing that's funny about Catholicism uh, is that the Catholics don't really read the Bible that much, uh, in part, I think, because they wrote it and they know what's in it and they don't want, to, they don't want you to find out. Uh, and so I think it's not an accident that it was actually starting to read the Bible toward the end of, of my experience. I mentioned the book of Revelation, where I started to think, wait, something's wrong here. Because uh, when you take it seriously, that's when you start to see what it really means and what kind of effects it will have on your life. And historically, the Catholics and versus the Protestants was partially about like the Protestants wanting everyone to have their own Bible, but the Catholics saying, oh, no, you need to only the qualified should have a copy. And is that kind of one of the reasons you think Catholics still don't read much of the Bible or am I? Yeah, um, yeah. It, it, that's that's basically the reason it was. I mean, the basic dispute in the Reformation was over whether uh one of the basic disputes in the in the Reformation was about whether the church was the ultimate authority of interpreting the scripture or individual conscience was. And the church, when you when you go to mass, when you go to uh, Catholic religion school, what you predominantly read is textbooks and catechisms where the church gives you its interpretation, uh, interpretation that has been uh, filtered through years of different philosophers and uh, their uh, take on what the creed should be. And Catholicism and Christianity, generally speaking, is much more an invention of St. Paul and St. Augustine than it is Jesus Christ uh, and you know, subsequent church fathers who put further spins on what they did. And um, you know, not a lot of Catholics don't really appreciate that. They don't like that, that historical context of the development of Christianity, which I would love to learn a lot more about. Uh, maybe we can have you back on this show. Uh, thank you, Jonathan, for the super chat. And Mary Aline with $5 says, I read The Fountainhead at 18. I loved it, but it took me at least a year to understand why there was no God. I was raised Catholic, she says. Well, so a lot of Catholics here. It's, I, I didn't realize there's two objectivists that were not raised Jewish. Interesting. <laughs> okay. Um, it's a, learning a lot today. Okay, uh, well, those are all the super chats. Um, I guess we can jump over to Clubhouse here in just a moment. Uh, we got a little bit of time over there. And then a lot happening today at I ARC UK, folks. Pay attention to this announce uh, these announcements here. Coming up uh, at 7 p.m. at the bottom of this hour, 7 p.m. UK time, it's Enjoy Parenting podcast with Lisa Van Dam and Kyle Steele. Sounds like an action movie duo, doesn't it? Kyle Steele and Van Dam. I'm looking forward to that. And then after 30 minutes, they're going to jump over to Clubhouse for the Enjoy Parenting After Show. Then at 8 p.m. UK time, Iran debates Europe live. 
Oh boy. Let's see what they say to Iran to his face. All right. Uh, that's coming up at 8 p.m. UK time. Uh, and then at 10 p.m. UK time, Ideas Matter is the episode. And it's the Life on Earth podcast with Robert and Amy Naser. And then they're going to jump over to Clubhouse at 10.30 p.m. UK time for the after show. Wow, so much happening today, everybody. Please consider uh, uh, becoming a member, a paid member for more, ex more content, exclusive content, and to help this thing uh, sustain and grow. Thank you, Johnny, for the $5. He says, Anthem was the first Ayn Rand book I read. The passage about the word I scared the hell out of me. I was a practicing Mormon at the time. Oh, man. Mormon is like a whole new, uh, a whole new level. Uh, Do a whole show on that. Yeah, we got to get a Mormon on, on the show. Um, uh, thank you, everybody, uh, for the super chats. Thank you, everybody, for watching. What was, Maybe Nikos, what was Nikos's uh, finale question? Oh, okay, yeah. it's not such a brilliant question. I'm just wondering. So, you know, the urban myth says that Atlas Rugged is the second more influential book after the Bible. So what would you say to all the people who said, look, I was a drug addict, a criminal, an alcoholic, and then I found God and I turned over my life. What would you say to that? Uh, first, you're right about the urban myth part. I don't think the evidence for that is really good. There was the, sh the survey that the Book of the Month Club did was based on a very, very small sample. Yeah. Uh, but the, um, to, the, to the people who changed their life because of religion, I mean, I, I, I tend to take it on face value to an extent. It's, it's, it's possible to change from basically hedonism to, to religion. And in certain ways, it may improve their life. Um, I think it's, it's better to have some belief system than to have no belief system at all. But if the belief system is toxic and you take it, you end up taking it seriously, it's still going to have negative effects on you uh, in the long run, for sure. So, uh, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to say more than that without looking at case studies. I bet, I bet there's yeah, of course. people have yeah. done studies yeah. of this kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, okay. reli religious and or Christian can mean so many different things depending on the person, the time and place. I mean, philosophy is complex. Um, so the question is like, what's the best possible? Like what's the best possible life I can have? And that's what I'm driven towards. It, I'm, not, I'm not interested in, uh, you know, just the, the better of two uh, bad possibilities and neither should the culture be. We, we don't want to end up in a theocracy because it's, you know, better than the left, quote unquote. And there is, and there is the expression dry drunk. Have you ever heard that Nikos? A dry Not drunk. Really. Yeah, it's somebody who's, who's accepted the program of AA and the spiritual aspects of AA, but they're still a narcissistic punk. They're just now you know, projecting that narcissism and obsession and self-obsession onto the program. Uh, I don't think you can do that with objectivism. I think objectivism uh, gives you a clean break of that because self-analysis is is required not as a way of of you know being the big man on campus at an aa meeting but and impressing people with your story but as a real as a real game changer for your own life so rational recovery is always better i think well, you're right that it's a lot harder to be a dry <laughs> drunk uh with objectivism intellectually speaking i don't i wouldn't say it's impossible i think i think i may have known some who fit into that category. Speaking of which, um, if you don't mind, uh, I'm uh, doing a clubhouse event uh, tonight myself, uh, 8 p.m. Central Time in the U.S., which I guess is 2 a.m. in in, uh, in London. So maybe not something your audience uh, would be able to come to, but we're going to be talking about conspiracy theories uh, on the Ayn Rand Club on Clubhouse tonight. And uh, yeah, there's I mean, there are people who call themselves objectivists who, who go in for those and we'll be talking about uh, uh, how they really got started in nine at 9-11 uh, and uh, have gotten worse since then. Hey, and I did the Justin O'Donnell show yesterday. He's a libertarian and he says he knows tons of objectivist Christians. So anything is possible for sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. there, there's definitely a, an objectivist equivalent of a dry drunk. You know, they're still dogmatic. <laughs> they're, you know, rationalistic. Mm -hmm. they, they're not selfish enough. Um, but Mark, let's let's bookmark that topic for an episode. Uh, Alcoholics Anonymous and sobriety and all that. I'm I'm coming up on ten years sober, so I'm, I have a feeling we we have a lot to discuss on that. Three years, yep. Oh, you're you got three years. Yep. Wow. Okay, we have a lot to talk about. All right, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. We got a little bit of time. 
uh, on Clubhouse before the festivities continue over here. Thank you, Ben, for coming on the show. Welcome. It was great. Thanks, Ben. All right. Thanks a lot, Ben. Nikos and Mark as well. And thank you all. And goodbye.